Wow, what a great time we've had so far, amen? Hey, it is time for our kindergarten through sixth graders, our kids. If you want to send your kids to Children's Church, now is the time. Miss R is right over here in the corner, so uh, send your kids on down. And guys, we'll see you a little bit later. Now remember, our kids will be picked up across the way in our fellowship hall at the end of our service. They'll be there to meet you. Wow, look at this. I love it. It's good to see all these kids in church. Amen. Man, this is exciting to see. God bless you all. Have fun, guys, and we'll see you in just a little bit. Today, we're going to be continuing about connecting to people. The way that I believe that the most important aspect of connecting to people is going to be the idea of knowing that we are to claim and to show the difference between a relationship with God and religion. That any time that, that we're wanting to just show religion, then we're going to be in trouble because the world, quite frankly, I believe, has had enough of religion. As a matter of fact, I think actually God himself has had enough of religion. I think God is desiring for people to understand that what we have is a relationship, not a religion. Amen. We have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And so when we begin to look and see what the world is, as we're going to make a connection to them, we're going to make it by showing a difference between our relationship we have with God and a religion that's out there. Because again, the world's had enough of it. We've had enough of it. God, I believe, has even had enough of it. And so today it's time that we in the church to make a connection is to be able to show the one true God. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And to see that the one true God is, is through Jesus Christ. Many have tried religion. Many have tried the church. Many have even tried Christians and being around Christians. Uh, but, but not God through Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people who want to try a whole lot of stuff. But we come to God through Jesus Christ. Today I want to look at, if you will, in the book of Isaiah 46... Starting at verse 1, we're going to be looking at the idea, again, of the one true God. In the book of Isaiah, what, what we're looking at is that the, the nation of Israel has been prophesied for many, many years that they would be taken into captivity. Here's the point that it's come. Isaiah has been preaching for many years about this, and, and the time is coming. And so now what he wants to do here, God is going to be speaking to, to Israel, but he's also going to be speaking to us again about the difference between the one true God and the other false gods. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Isaiah 46, verses 1 through 13? And if you are able to, would you please stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning? Isaiah 46, starting at verse 1. The Bible says here, Baal bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the, the beasts on the cattle, and your carriages were heavily loaded. A burden to the weary beast. In verse 2 it says, and they stoop, they stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but they have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, you, I have made and will bear, even will I carry you and will deliver you. To whom will you liken to me and to make me equal and compare me, that we should be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag and they weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes it a, a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear it on the shoulders and they carry it and set it in places and it stands. From its place it shall not move. And though one cries out to it, yet, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of the troubles. Remember this and show yourselves, men. Recall to mind, you transgressors, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from the far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Father, we come to you and we, we thank you for the, this time of worship. Thank you for allowing us to just experience you. And I pray, Father, that, that your glory is, is so evident here in this place. 
and our hearts are set right for you, Father. And now I pray that as I, I share this word and give the message, Lord, that I pray that the words that I'm about to say are not going to be my words, but I, say, I pray, Lord, they're yours. I pray that the message I'm about to give is one that you've given me. And Lord, that the response from everyone here and all those watching would be as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. As we are called to make a connection to people, and that's what we've been talking about all year long, connecting to serve. We are to connect to people and make that connection the way that we possibly can. We must declare and prove that there is no one or nothing like God. That's what the world needs to see from the church. And we talked about even that song that I, I, I talked about a while ago, the glory of, uh, of God has left the church. The glory of God will be in the church as long as God's people have a heart for him, and that's what we're trying to do. Isaiah was speaking, basically, if you will, as, though, as they were being hauled off into captivity, and what he wanted to do here was to show the difference between Jehovah God and all the other false gods. And the, and the nation of Israel had begun to follow after all of these other gods. And, and they, the God had made a promise to them, as long as you follow me, there will always be somebody on the throne from Israel. But he said, the moment you begin to stray away from me, and the minute that you begin to go after other gods, and in, in the essence, trade me in for something else, something that you think is better in life. He said, then I'm going to remove my hands from you and people are going to come in and you will be taken away to captivity. He'd been predicting this for, for years and now it has finally come. So what I want to look at today is the idea again of the one true God. I want to talk about a couple things. First thing is that when we see in this text is God is the only powerful God, that all the other gods have absolutely no power. Jehovah God, the God that we worship, the God that is, is made the world into existence, this is the God that has the power. We see that, that there, are, there are false gods, and he rely, re, refers to them here in verse 1. He even begins to name a couple of names. Now, you know someone's serious about accusations when they begin to name names. So he began to name a couple of names of the gods that had become prominent to the nation of Israel from outside sources. And so what we look at is we see that these other false gods, then he told them first is that they were brought down into an image. They had taken the idea of God and they had wanted to bring it into an image, something that they could look at, something, if you will, that they could, uh, <clears throat> something that they could understand. And that's kind of the way that sometimes if we're not careful, we'll even do in the church. We'll try to, to bring God into something of our understanding or even of our liking, of our desire, the way we want it to be done, the way we think it should fit. And then we even create the church. And if we're not careful that the church and the things of the church can even become a false God to us. And so we bring it down to an image. And it's, again, an image that we can understand. But folks, can I tell you this? We will never be able to understand God. We will never be able to think like God. As a matter of fact, he tells us very plainly, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I, my thoughts are so much higher. He said, you couldn't understand me even if you tried because I am so much more than you are. And so, but we like to try to bring God down into something that we understand, even if you will, something that we can agree with, if you like, something that will make us feel better about ourselves. But they brought him down to an image, and the Bible tells us in Romans 1, 22 and 23, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for, for images resembling the mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. So he said they've taken this, uh, this invisible God and brought him into something again that we can understand. And then he goes on in verse 25 of that same chapter, and he says this, who exchanged the truth of God, the truth, the absolute who God is and what God is all about, and basically took it and realized or thought in themselves there's something better than Jehovah God. There's something better than the Creator God. And I'm going to exchange this Almighty God that's all, all present, all knowing, and I'm going to transform Him. I'm going to change Him, exchange Him into something that I like. It says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. 
Because anything that is outside of God is a lie. But they've exchanged the truth for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. So he said, what's happening today and what happened here, what happened in Old Testament times was God was there. God had promised to be with them forever and ever to bless them, to work in their lives, to guide them, protect them. And then all of a sudden they began to look out and see that they thought something else out there was better than what they already had. Something out there was better than God and they began to exchange it, if you will. Trading the glory of God for something that they deemed to be better. Something they deemed that they could understand. So they were bowing down. These images were bowing down to these people were bringing uh, an image. Then it says they were, the images themselves were now bowing down. They were humbled. These gods that they had made could not move themselves. Now, here's what's so, so strange is even when God's promise of captivity had come, they still wanted to hang on to those false gods. And so what they did was these gods that could not deliver them, these gods that they cried out to that could not answer them, these gods who allowed people to come and take them over, these same gods that could not move, they did not forsake them and leave them and say, you know what? We don't need these anymore. We're going to go ahead and, and just get rid of them. The Bible says that they literally took them with them. Even into captivity, these gods were now bowing down themselves because they were also being taken into captivity. And it made me begin to think about my life sometimes. It's how I began to trans after something else, and I began to trace after it and, and go grab onto it, and I find out what it's doing to my life. But rather than letting it go, I want to compromise, and I want to say, God, I, I know this has gotten me where I am, but you know what? Can I just keep a little bit of it? I want to hang on to this. And, and God, I want you too. But the Bible says that's not possible. And so they literally took those gods who had no power and they loaded them up and said, you know what? We're going, we're going to take them with us. He said these gods now themselves were being humbled. They were being hauled in, into captivity. And not only that, they became a burden to the people. Now, as explained in the first service, these gods were not these little, uh, little trinkets that they would make and set up on the shelf somewhere. These gods were, men, they were huge, and, and they would set them up, and they would bow down to them. And as a matter of fact, they were so heavy that one person probably couldn't hold them. Remember, it said that they took all their gold and silver and different things, and they fashioned them into this huge idol that was theirs, and they bowed down before it. So when it came time to uh, go into captivity and they were going to take them with them one guy couldn't do it and they became they became a burden to the people because they literally had to take a couple of guys get a dolly if you will I don't know what kind of dollies they had and they literally had to put him on a dolly haul them out lift two or three guys pick this idol up set it on the 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 the, the, the wagon and then the beast the the animals had to now become a bird they were burdened to them because they had to pull these heavy things and so these gods became a burden to the people rather than being a burden to the god and so he says, they have even bowed down. They've now been humbled, but they also have become a burden to the people. The thing that I want us to understand about other religions is this. Other religions offer ways to save yourself or endear yourself to God through doing actions or keeping rules. That we have to be burdened. This God, these false gods burden us to make us act like that we're supposed to act to them. That we to, are somehow to win favor to them. We are to sacrifice over to these gods continually giving, giving, and giving. And trying to win favor with these gods. When all along Jehovah God says, I don't want to be a burden to you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to relieve the burden from you. I'm going to take care of you. You don't have to worry about me. You don't have to take me anywhere. You don't have to make idols to me. You don't have to do any of this stuff. I am God and I will be there for you. So the question I have is, do you carry your God or does your God carry you? Because I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of people carrying their God around today. Sometimes it's in our wallet. 
Sometimes it's in our heart. Sometimes it's in our mind. Sometimes it's in another person. Sometimes it's in our job. Whatever it is, that that's what brings us satisfaction. And we're continually trying to sacrifice over to win favor. Can I tell you this much right now? You can never do more than you're doing right now to make God love you more. You can't do enough to make God love you more. But here's the cool thing. You can't do anything to make God love you any less. Because the Bible tells me that even when I was a sinner, that I was lost and I was rejecting God, guess what? He still loved me so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. And if I were to believe in him, I could have eternal life. That sounds like a pretty good deal, amen? So my God loves me. I don't have to do anything to make God love me more. But I don't also have to worry that whatever I'm going to do is going to make God love me any less. He loved me at my worst. And he's still going to love me. But not these gods. They had in their mind and otherworldly gods that we see in, in the world today. They're all demanding, you sacrifice to me. You give everything to me. You do work your way up and make a better person. And you become better. Even sometimes we think this with our God is that we think, well, if I'm a good person, God will love me. As a matter of fact, we sometimes tell our kids, oh, you better watch out. You better be a good little boy or girl or God's going to get you. That's not God. That's not Jehovah. He loves your kids, amen? That's the message we need to be telling them. God loves you, son. God loves you, daughter. God loves you, husband. God loves you, wife. God loves you, world. He loved you so much that he gave Jesus to die on the cross for you. You don't have to work and be good. God loves loves you. But we see these false gods that they were there and the people felt like they had to do all they could to make these gods happy. So my question again is, do you carry God, your God, or does your God carry you? Jehovah God carries me through the difficult times of my life. He carries me through times when I can't make it on my own. This is the one true God. And he talks about this to them. He even, again, names names of some gods. So we look and we see that God is the only powerful God. We saw the false idols, but now I want to look at the one true God. And what about him? We see here in this text that we see that he created us. We are the crowning parts of a creation. God created you and I. He is the potter. We're the clay. He molds us and makes us what he wants. We're not him. But here's what we do. Sometimes I think we say, well, God created us. But then what we're trying to do, if we're not careful, even as Christians, if we're not careful, we try to recreate God. Or we try to remake God. Or we try to make God over. So that God, what we want to do is we want to take this almighty God that created us. And we, if we're not careful, we want to try to take God, mold him into the kind of God that satisfies us that satisfies the world, that looks good, looks palpable to to the world. The world will like him. And so we recreate God. Sometimes if we're not careful, we'll try, and we have people even today trying to recreate the word, remake the word, make it where it fits, make it where it sounds different than it used to, make it where it fits lifestyles in the year 2021 better than it did in the 1950s and even when Jesus was walking. We try to recreate the word. But folks, listen to me. The one true God cannot be created. He was never created. He always was. In the beginning, what? God. In the beginning, God. God created us and we, we cannot return the favor to him no matter how hard we try. So we see then that God created us. The second one is that he tells us here, he says, I will carry you. The Bible tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden and burdened. Guess what? I'll give you rest. You can't go in another step. That's okay, I've got you. You don't think you can make another day? That's okay, because I'll I'll, I'll make it for you. I'll give you what you need to make it. If you're burdened, man, I'm not going to add another burden onto you. 
As a matter of fact, I will take those burdens away from me. He even tells us, put, put upon me, take off the yoke of the world that is heavy and, 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 and destroys you and wears you down and beats you down and tells you you're not good enough for anything. Take that yoke off. Take it off and put the yoke on me. They put it there and my yoke is heavy and it's, it's not heavy. It's light. It's easy. It doesn't burden you. It frees you up. This is what God is trying to do. This is what Jehovah God does. This is what the one true God is able to do. Come and I will give you rest. I will make it be okay for you. I will continue a work that I've begun in you forever. I will continue it on. And not only will he carry us, but he will deliver us. Psalm 32, 7 says this. You're my hiding place. God When the world is after me, when the world is beating me down, when the world is telling me I'm not good enough, you, you, God, you're my hiding place. I can come to you. You're my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. And listen to what he does. He says, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. He says, you surround me with deliverance. I will take care of you. I will get you through this. I will get another day for you. I will make it to where it's worth going on. When you don't think it's worth taking another step, I will deliver you. When you think you're being beaten down, I will deliver you from that. He says, I will deliver you. And the last one is, he's incomparable. As a matter of fact, look at verse 5. He says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me? He says, you're trying to take and compare me to all these other gods. And he's, he's incomparable. What can we take the creator of all of the life? What out there really is comparable to him? What out there that we could, that we could, take hold of and we can put into our lives even into our bodies what out there is is comparable to almighty god he says who who will you compare me to just a chapter over from here where we are isaiah 45 6 says i'm the lord and then he caps it off with this there is no other I'm the Lord, there is no other. No matter what you try to do, there's no other like me. And then I want to wrap it up with this. He is different from everything else. God is different than anything else. He is different than any other God. And I have all the time people ask me, what makes you think that this God is the true God? What makes you think that these other gods out there are not the real God? And it's very simple because look what he says. And he answers that question down here in verses 8 through 11. He says, remember this and show yourselves, men. Recall to mind you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do, my, I will do all my pleasures. And he says, I will bring it all to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. So here's what makes Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, different than any other God, is these two things. First of all, he has prophecy on his side. In other words... Everything that God says he will do, he has done. He didn't wait till it was over and then go, oh, hey, I, I, I did that. 
As a matter of fact, he has told us over and over these things that are going to be done. And guess what? They happen. We see in the book of Genesis all the way through Revelation, we see that what he has prophesied, what he has said he would do, what he says that will happen has happened, or yet we see that it is still coming. No other idol, no other thing has been able to do that like Jehovah God has done. What he says he will do, he will do. His plans will take place, and he will do his plan. God doesn't wait on something to happen. As a matter of fact, we see that there's prophecies being fulfilled every day. We look and we see even the prophecy of Jesus. Someone says, well, what makes you think Jesus is the actual Son of God? Because if you'll look back in the Old Testament and, and see all the prophecies that were told of the, become, of the coming of the Messiah, you would see that it was an astronomical odd that any person could come up with maybe five of those. But Jesus came up with numbers of them, scores of them, of the prophecies that were fulfilled because he said God put, told us that and he made it happen. Nobody else could do that. So all the prophecies that God has said about Jesus has been fulfilled. He didn't again wait for it to happen. If you look in the book of Daniel, as a matter of fact, I taught the book of Daniel a few years ago here in the church. And one of the things that, that, that is true about Daniel is there's a lot of scholars who think Daniel was written after the events happened. You know why? Because whatever God said in the book of Daniel, they happened so precisely. And even writers say that was not possible by human beings. You couldn't get it that correct. But only God could. So he has prophecy on his side we see even in the book of revelation we see all the things that the book of revelation says folks they're coming to pass and we're seeing prophecies fulfilled every single day we see god is working through through people to fulfill prophecy it's happening over and over and over god is using even people who we look at maybe who are making dumb decisions in life Dumb decisions in the, the government around the world. We may not agree with everything, but God is even using those to fulfill his prophecy to bring to pass those things which he said thousands of years ago will come to pass. He's making it happen. God has prophecy on his side. But not only that, let me wrap it up with this. He has power on his side. He doesn't only have prophecy, he has power. God is able to, to speak all things into existence. God is able to, to look at all of eternity and see it. And he is able to take care of it. As a matter of fact, David Guzik said this. God is not just watching the entire parade of history. He's directing it. He's directing the parade. There is nothing going to happen that God doesn't let happen. There is nothing that God wants to happen that can't happen. He says right here in the closing, he says, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. Nothing or no one can stop God. That's the power that our, our God has. And that is the God, listen to me, that is the God you need and this is the God that we need to show. That's the God we need in our lives. The God that will not be a burden to you. The God that will help you. The God that will encourage you. The God that will carry you. The God that will get you through. The God will supply all your needs. That's the God you need. You don't need all these other gods that are false and lying and, and can't do anything and we have to carry them around. That's not the God we need. But listen to me, that's the God that the world is turning to. That's the God that so many in the church are beginning to exchange the glory of God and bring it into the worldly stuff. That's what burdens my heart. Is how many of us, myself included, are taking this God that we need, this glory of, that he has, and changing it for lies. My friends, today we need this God. You need this God. And if you don't have him, you can call on his name today. He has provided a way for you to get to him, and it's not through you working harder. 
It's not for you, through you becoming a better individual. It's not from you reaching deep down inside yourself and, and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It is just you sur surrendering yourself to him, saying, God, I need you. I need you. Man, would you call on him today? I want to ask the praise team to come on back up here as we get ready now to step into this invitation time. But as they're coming, I want to ask you, is that the God you have? Do you have that God? Or are you trading him in? Maybe you say, listen, you can be saved and trade that glory in. And you can begin to trace after those things of the world. You can begin to mount on the world stuff on you and take on all the desires of the world and trying to fulfill all the world wants you to have. But, oh, is that, is that worth trading in God? Would you just surrender yourself to him today? Surrender yourself to him today. And maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I've never received Christ in my life. You may be home saying, I've never received Christ. Man, would you receive him today? The one who died on the cross for you. The one who didn't ask you to do anything except just believe. You don't have to achieve anything. Just believe. With every head bow, as we step into these next few moments, ask God to speak to your heart. Ask God to strengthen you, to encourage you. Ask the one true God to make himself so known to you. My friend, if you need to call on his name this morning, would you call on him? I'll be down front, man. If you want to come, I'll, I'll pray with you. Whatever you need, would you come? You at home, we have people at the office right now that will answer your call. If you'll just call and someone will be there to talk to you. The one true God is waiting for you. Can I tell you, he is all you need. But you do need him. He can be yours. Just ask. Father, hear us today. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Savior, God, that before this moment is past, they'll call upon your name. Maybe there's someone here, maybe there's someone at home that God is feeling so burdened by the things of life the weight of this world is just bearing down. Lord, the hurt of this world, the hurt of loss, the uncertainties, Lord, it's just weighing them down and they're so afraid. God, would you give them peace right now as they call out to you? God, give them peace. Give them strength. Let them feel you today, God. Pour yourself over them. And God, if there's someone that needs to pray, Father, they'd come forward and pray. God, it's time for the church to, to seek your glory again. Would you do that here in the hearts of, of everyone here? God, what could we trade in you for? What are we trading Lord, forgive us. Hear our prayer now. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you to stand and would you sing with us? If God's speaking to your heart, man, surrender today. He's what you need. Amen? He's what you need. Let's sing.